Hey everybody, Dr. Tim and Hillary for another Dr. Tim's Aquatics podcast. How are you doing this morning, Hillary? I am doing great. I feel another like it's one? been a while since we recorded one of these. Yep. And then things are going to get busy. We got what, Aquashella, Reef Stock, Reef Lapalooza, the World Aquaculture Association, Global. And that just takes us through March. Yeah. Yes, I'm so excited. <laughs> get your suitcase packed. We're on the road again, folks. We're going to be all over. Check. Oh, the, yeah. uh, we have a calendar on our website. I have to make sure oh. that's filled out. Quick. I like that. Um, we'll have lots of people all over the place. So uh, today's a question and answer. Yep. Oh, great. All right. Let's open the mailbox and get started. Okie dokie. So first question we've got is, Hello, I first tried going to askdoctim.com, but it doesn't appear that your site is ready for questions. So I'm asking it here. I need to know if I can add eco balance and waste away at the same time. If not, is it okay if I add them in the same day? Per the instructions, I am to use waste away twice a week and eco balance once a week. I have my protein skimmer off for extended periods of time. Please advise. Uh, we generally do not recommend adding waste away and eco balance on the same day, much less at the same time, un unless you cut the proportions back because the dosage of each is one mil per gallon. Um, and so if you wanted to add a half a mil of waste away and a half a mil of eco balance, fine, but one mil of each is a potential for overdosing. And the reason we don't recommend is if you add too much and you haven't been using these products in the past, the there's a lot of bacteria. If there's a lot of nutrients, organics, nitrate, phosphate, they'll grow or bloom, you know, grow so fast. We call that a bloom where the water gets cloudy and there's a potential for them to remove uh, so much oxygen from the water that your fish and corals will suffer. So generally we recommend don't add more, you know, two or more bacterial products on the same day. You just run the risk um, of an overdose. So we recommend you wait 48 hours, at least 24 hours, one, one day, one, the next day would be a better uh, way to approach it. Okay. Now, this is something that I feel the need to ask because it's something I'm not aware of. Is the website askdoctim.com the correct website or is that even one of our websites? Oh, it's our, it's one of our websites. It's supposed to point um, to a question part, but now I've got to get the uh, webmaster working on that and find out what's going on. So, but no, it is askdoctortim.com. It's on the back of our bottle and um, it should be working. All right. Maybe we'll look at that. I looked at this last night as I'm adding these questions. I was like, oh, huh. Okay. We'll check. So good question. All right. Moving on. Number two. Hello. I just ordered some one and only for my saltwater fowler tank. I accidentally ordered the one and only for freshwater aquariums. I wanted to check that I cannot put this in my saltwater tank and I need to return it. Is that correct? Or is there a chance that my tank will be okay since I don't have corals in it? Okay, so Fowler, F-O-W-L-R, fish only with live rock for those that aren't jargon um, educated, I guess. Um, the fresh water will work better than nothing in the salt water or a marine tank, it won't harm anything. And it will definitely cycle your faster, better, or I'm sorry, cycle your tank faster than adding nothing. So you can go ahead and use it, or you could return it, that's up to you. Um, but it will not harm anything. And as an aside, there's no difference between the saltwater version and the reef version. You know, there isn't a coral nitrifying bacteria and a fish nitrifying bacteria. There's a freshwater version, there's a saltwater marine reef version. 
just two versions. Um, but short answer, it will not harm anything and it's better than not adding any bacteria at all. And, and actually, if I can, it says we rate these because somebody, everybody wants to know, okay, how much should I add? But for a pretty good load, if you are starting out your saltwater tank, a lot of times people are doing a fishless cycling. Now, this person doesn't mention that, do they, Hillary? Uh, no, they don't. Not in this one. Yeah. Because if you're doing a fishless cycling, you're controlling the amount of ammonia you're adding. So if you do have, say, the freshwater version, and you know, it's a hassle to return it and all that, you can add it, add the whole bottle, no matter size of the tank, you can't overdose. And then just start with a little bit of ammonia. Instead of four drops, you know, one drop per, or four drops per gallon, go with one drop per gallon. There's no right or wrong way. And, and you know, I, we say four drops per gallon, but we have people that have betta tanks and they're literally going to put one small betta fish in their tank. There's no reason to cycle with four drops per gallon uh, because that is so much ammonia. That's the enough ammonia for probably 50 or 60 bettas. I mean, they're not, they're not that active of a fish. They don't generate that much ammonia. So you can always use one drop and just, you know, slowly cycle uh, the tank. Make sense, Hillary? Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Moving on to question number three. Oh, this is one I've been waiting for this because it's the season, it's cold in places. So this person has asked, I ordered some EcoBalance online and it got delayed in shipping. When I received the EcoBalance, it was partly frozen, kind of like a slushy. Is it still good or should I throw it away? Good news, it is still good. So EcoBalance, waste away, clear up, refresh, Everything, all our bacterial products, except the one and only, are heterotrophic bacteria. And these bacteria form spores. I think we've talked about how we grow them or a little bit. Um, but we grow them in these huge chemostats. And we actually take the resulting mixture of bacteria and nutrients, use a high-speed centrifuge, separate that out, end up with this paste put it in freeze dryers and we freeze dry the bacteria because once these bacteria are stressed, they form spores, kind of they put the cocoon up, you know, force field shields up. Um, and <laughs> I'm not going to do Star Trek. Uh, and that's completely different than the nitrifying bacteria, which is why the nitrifiers don't have a lot of protection against freezing. So as the EcoBalance was traveling from our warehouse to your house and it, the bottle was getting colder and colder, the bacteria sense, I mean, they, they're from the temperature response, that they need to sporulate. And that's what they do. So slushy, frozen, all those products, EcoBalance, Waste Away, Clear Up, Refresh, can be completely frozen solid and they're still going to work the ammonia, you know, the, the uh, nitrifying bacteria, that's not the case. So stuff's still good. Now, what you should not do, do not run it under hot water. Don't try to flash the thought. Just put it out at room temperature, let it um, uh, slowly uh, melt, thaw out, you know, don't try to speed it up by running under hot water. And I will say on a note, um, just because I was on our website the other day, there's a fun little thing that pops up when you first go to the website. Um, if you are buying the one and only and you're worried about it getting colder, or if you live somewhere cold, you don't want it to freeze, you're worried about it. We can add little packets to your shipping. Um, is that correct? Right, we have a extreme weather because, you know, Hillary being in Vegas in the summertime, it's 120 degrees. Maybe you want to protect that because it's going to sit out there in the mailbox. So we have an extreme weather package, um, which we add a start or a insulated bag with either a, a heat pack in the wintertime 
or an ice pack in the summertime. Uh, we don't automatically add that because one is an expense and then it also increases the shipping. And right now in Southern California, it's gorgeous and you would never need that. So that's why that flashes up. That's set to come uh, that, you know, cold weather warning comes up in the winter months because it's really the buyer's responsibility uh, to know if it's going to be in clement weather. And the other thing to consider, because, you know, that one question before the person was in, you know, had slush, the post offices and warehouse is, are not generally kept below freezing because there's workers in there. So one way to save yourself a little bit of money and just the headache of maybe having the, the uh, one and only arrive frozen is potentially if you able to ship it to your office. Instead of it sitting out in your mailbox all day long, freezing, um, maybe you could ship it to your office. That's a, a, another way to uh, ensure that it's going to arrive safely. Oh, that, that's some good advice. Yeah. Or, uh, you know, some package, uh, if we ship with FedEx and you can say, you know, hold it at the local FedEx because inside that FedEx shop, or, you know, people aren't. The, the temperature in the, in the FedEx store <laughs> is, not, is not zero. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's free. Now you've got to go pick it up, but again, it's, it's better than having it arrive or at your, at your pet, most post office box. Mouth is not working today, Hiller. Uh, post office box and just sitting out there for hours and freezing solid. So, you know, there's, there's okay. ways to get that, consider it. Yep. And, you know, another way to think about it is if you've ever ordered fish or corals or anything online, this is the same sort of stuff that you would have to deal with. Like bacteria a little bit more hardy, I would say, than most stuff that you're going to be ordering. But, you know, like you said, I'm in Vegas. That's something that I keep in mind. There's no way on earth I'm going to put in an order for anything that's going to have to arrive here over the summer months. Yeah, not a chance. A little bit, a little bit of common sense is is what's needed, and and we just don't have the the time, my shipping crew, to to you know look at the weather at every place we're going, you know, and shipping things to every day. So, little communication responsibility on everyone's part. Yep. Okay, this one isn't necessarily a question, more of a comment. Um, it came in from YouTube. Just wanted to say thanks. I just finished watching slash listening to the podcast about ammonia. I learned a lot. It was really interesting. And to that note, if you enjoyed that, you should definitely go check out the articles that Dr. Tim has written in Coral Magazine. It's a three-part one. Oh, I don't have them with me. I think it started in September in the September issue. And the most recent one just came out. Fascinating read. It's stuff that you've heard if you've listened to the podcast, but it's also just still good information. So. Yeah, and it, it's kind of a history of uh, nitrification in, in the marine aquaria. And uh, it was kind of fun to write. Yeah, it, it was, like I said, it was really interesting. It's, it's cool that we've talked about this stuff. I was like, oh yeah, yeah, okay, okay. I know that, that's cool. So, and two, it's another another way of looking at it. You hear us talking about it, but also if you're, you know, a visual person, you can see there's some uh, chemical equations that are written out there for you to enjoy as well, if that's your cup of tea. Okay, moving on to a new question. Hi, I was using Dr. Tim's one and only fishless cycle in my Red Sea 170. I'm now on day 11 with no fish and the parameters are pH of eight, ammonia of 1.5, nitrite of one. These numbers are the same as they have been the whole time with the exception of the nitrite that's gone up from 0.5. The salinity is 1.021 and the temperature is 27. Um, I'm using a see, salifer test kit and have double checked. Do we do nothing and just wait? Should we add more Dr. Tim's or should we add more fish and more Dr. Tim's? Thanks for your help. So um, there's a lot of stuff here. Typically when 
the nitrite doesn't move. And, and they've added ammonia a couple of times, Hillary. I was trying to mentally make a checklist in my mind. Um, let's see. I, you know, it doesn't say. Okay. A, a lot of times when people, you know, write us and they say their nitrite hasn't moved, they're doing a fishless cycling and they're adding ammonia. That to me means that either you're, you're using live sand and the live sand is contributing to ammonia and there's just this steady state and that will take the tank longer to cycle because there's just a lot more of ammonia in the system. And, and um, also what's happening, as I've discussed in the past, is the live sand doesn't have nitrifiers, it has heterotrophs and the heterotrophs are competing with the nitrifiers for micronutrients like phosphate and things like that. So you can actually kind of stall the system by this heterotrophs, which is why I say never add like our waste away or equal balance, any of that stuff until after you've cycled, because in a newly set up aquarium, they're generally not that much um, of the micronutrients, which the nitrifiers need all bacteria need. So it's either that or uh, the users committed the one cardinal sin, and we put this on the directions, where they kept on adding ammonia until they got a reading of two. We get this more frequently than you would think, where we just want four drops. That's it. Four drops per gallon, done. But people will do that, and they'll do a ammonia test right away, and it doesn't read two. And so they keep on adding more ammonia and more ammonia or yeah, more ammonia and more ammonia until they can finally get a reading. I'm going to get a reading on this kit. And by now, who knows how much the ammonia is. And the reasons for that are, are varied. One, it takes time for the drops to be distributed through the water. Uh, plus some of the test kits actually can't read that high. So, um, you know, if, if you've got a, a per, test kit that reads low levels uh, and you're not going to get an accurate reading by adding all this ammonia. Then all of a sudden uh, something happens and, and uh, you've just, you've just added too much ammonia to the system and the nitrite is stuck there and the water chemistry parameters are all off. The third reason is the nitrite test kit is no good, but nitrite's a pretty hardy test. Um, so it's usually the live sand is kind of the, the one that seems to cause a constant chronic low level of nitrite. All right. Good advice. I feel like we, we've had that, that before is like sand is the, you know, culprit behind things that people don't think about. The live sand can definitely be a, uh, a negative i you know it uh, it's i think i think my experience in talking you know all these years with people is the live sand seems to be a bigger hassle than it's worth that's what we should do we should come out with dr tim's sand <laughs> i got we have asf sand oh i didn't know that see learning new stuff every single podcast yes use it <laughs> Two, two sizes. What size? Um, Go ahead. Shameless plug. <laughs> fine and medium. I'll send you some pictures and uh, you can do a, a cast, but it comes in uh, oh, geez. 11 pound backs. Yep. All right. And if people want to go buy that and go through our website. Yes. Uh, Webmaster is putting it up now as we speak. Woohoo. All right, you guys hear that? If you're setting up a new tank, go, go get some uh, sand from us. Mm -hmm. Reduce the headache that you might have with any extra unexpected ammonia in your sand. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, Dr. Tim, my 15 gallon tank nutrients have bottomed out and now I have dinos and some hair algae. I'm going to use your waste away. What do you suggest that I do to get my nutrients back up? Should I just feed heavier? 
Well, that's generally what you, you want to do is feed heavier. The other thing to do is look at one, what's removing all that. You know, you might be feeding fine, but you've, you know, you've got a roller filter, a protein skimmer, a UV filter uh, bags, uh, all these devices that are removing every little bit of organic. And, you know, the organics are being converted, broken down to ammonia, which is then um, being converted to nitrate. So what we recommend a lot is uh, put your skimmer on a timer, you know, run the tank dirty a little bit. The, the ocean and even coral reefs are not distilled water with no nutrients. There's plenty of nutrients and organics and things in that. And the biggest air that people make is trying to run, in my opinion, is trying to run their water too clean. And this is how you end up with dinoflagellates and, or cyanobacteria and all sorts of problems. Um, so before overfeeding, look at all the removal, removing devices you're using and maybe remove one or two of those removing devices. Uh, now, I do want to point out in this person's defense, and I, I don't know because I don't give the information, but I'm thinking if it's a 15 gallon tank, I've got a 20 gallon tank at home and like there's not much space for anything. It's, it's got, I think, like a little sock filter filter so sock, sock filter on it. Yeah. <laughs> but like, I don't have anything like, I'm, I'm just wondering like if they don't have a skimmer or if they don't have any of that extra stuff, if they're just using like filter floss or filter socks or something. But what would be causing such a low value? I don't know. I can't imagine having such low values. I feed so heavy. So this is I'm like, I was thinking about that the other day. I'm like, man, like, it's crazy. People have the issue of not having enough nutrients. And I have an overload of nutrients. Yeah. I mean, so, so say you don't have a skimmer, it's a small tank. You don't have any of those things. Um, there has to be a sink. I mean, it means something that's sucking the nutrients out. And if your tank is looking good, it's not overrun with algae and things like that, then it has to be coral. And I would almost say that you need to harvest your tank a little bit and remove, maybe you've got too much coral in the, in a 15 gallon tank. It's um, definite possibility. Something is removing the nutrients. Um, now, if you've got, if it's an older tank and you've got a, a substrate that's an uh, inch and a half, two inches or thicker, you might have some denitrification going on in there. Um, but there's got to be something that's, assuming you're feeding, I mean, the person doesn't tell us how much we're feeding, how much they're feeding. And then, I mean, in your, in your 10 gallon tank, how many fish do you have? Mm, I've got three and I feed a fairly decent amount, but I guess if you only have corals, you might not be feeding every single day and you might be feeding limited amounts. So Right. If you have a well-stocked coral reef going on, that may be the issue. Right. And so something like our uh, beneficial do-it-yourself uh, frozen food would be good because it's all nutrients. It's not, there's no waste in there, no binders, no fillers, no carbs and things like that, that, that organisms in the ocean really can't get any nutritional value from. Um, and you can squish that in your finger and, and, or, I mean, even if you have a coral tank, you probably have some, uh, a cleanup crew and, and they can eat that and start the system. So that's one thing to start with a couple of cubes of that, of our uh, beneficial fish food. Yep. That is a good recommendation. And two, if you don't want to do a whole cube, you could even do like half cubes, I guess. Like when you make the tray, just don't fill those little cubes all the way up and then you know a couple of half take, ones you could take a cube and cut it in half that too but okay. not the easiest thing to do when they're frozen <laughs> all right okay so hopefully uh 15 gallon tank with bottomed out nutrients 
hope you've got that uh, back on the mend. Get a fish for your tank. That'll help you. And, feed. and if you're listening to this and uh, are thinking about submitting a question, um, a little detail helps. Uh, we don't want encyclopedias, um, yes. but a, a little bit of detail. What's your filter system? What's your water source? Um, I don't know if I'm jumping ahead. I mean, there's a question yesterday where the person's got this, you know, they're using DI water and their pH is 6.5. And they're wondering why it's taking so long to cycle. Well, you've got two strikes as we've talked about a lot in the past, you know, low pH and low hardness. Nitrifiers don't like that. So they're going to grow slow. Yep. Alrighty. So these next two questions are the ones that I've sent you in advance. They're a little bit more complex. One of them came in from YouTube and it's talking about someone who worked at a fish farm and was losing angelfish um, until about a week after the ammonia spiked. Um, let's see. Yeah. Yeah. It does. It's, you can tell, I don't think English is their first language. So <laughs> there's a bit of confusion in the question, but if you, hopefully it makes a little bit more sense. Yeah. So what they're asking is do all, do all ammonia removing products. So they get ammonia spikes and they're looking to understand how the ammonia removing products work. And there's two strategies. One is some products work by lowering the pH of the water. And when you lower the pH, more of the total ammonia in the water converts to the ammonium, the NH4 form, which is the non-toxic form. So that's one strategy, just lower the pH. Now, the, the problem with many fish is they don't like low pH. Also, if you have, if you're in an area with any type of alkalinity or buffering like Southern California, Nevada, um, you're going to have to add a lot of that product to affect a change in the pH. If you're in upstate New York, Florida, or the Pacific Northwest that has water with very low alkalinity or buffering capacity, it's quite easy to add these products and, sh and quickly shift the pH to a low value. Um, the, I don't really like this approach because one, now this person's keeping angelfish, angelfish live, you know, in, in the South American low pH water. So they're fine with that. But most likely the fish they bought, well, they're, they, they, I don't know if they're wild fish or not. They're at a fish farm, maybe. But um, that's one way to do it, is, is use a product that basically lowers the pH of the water. Not the, not the best way. The other way is to use a product like our um, Aqua Cleanse, which is an oxidizing agent, a chemical that actually breaks the ammonium bond apart and doesn't, you know, doesn't, mess with pH. And if you add a lot, a lot, a lot of it, it can do that, but that's not the strategy. The strategy behind the product is basically to, to break that chemical bond. Um, and that's a safer way to progress. So, uh, you know, we're, we try to be honest here. So products like prime and, uh, our aqua cleanse, uh, generally work that way. Uh, you don't want to overuse them but it's better than certain other products that just play with the pH, which may or may not work depending on the buffering capacity of your aquarium water. And then another part of the question, it's more clear to me about the processes and ability of the bacteria to transfer ammonia in low pH water. 
So, so as we've spoken in the past, when the pH is low, the ammonia is in the NH4 ammonium form, and that is not the form the bacteria can use because that's a cation. It has that plus charge, NH4 plus. And the cations cannot pass through the cell membrane of the bacterium. So that ammonium is not available to the bacteria to convert. And that's why nitrification stops in low pH waters because the, the ammonium can't be utilized by the bacteria. And this person thought, I thought KH plays a role in the amount of bacteria. Now, I, I think there's an English translation. KH or, or alkalinity plays a role in the rate that bacteria can nitrify. If you have no alkalinity, like Pacific Northwest water, add a little acid to it, the water becomes you know, pH 4, pH 5 really quick. Whereas here in Southern California, where our alkalinity is quite high, you have to add a lot of whatever acid that you're working with to get the pH to drop. But the bacteria since they prefer the higher pH because more of the total ammonia is in the ammonia form rather than the ammonium form are going to work faster because they can actually, you know, get at it. The, the ammonium doesn't diffuse, but the ammonia does higher pH, more ammonia, which can diffuse into the cell, the bacteria convert it. And then did I, this is the person writing, did I mistake? And the real link with nitrification was pH. Yes, the real link with nitrification is pH. KH or alkalinity affects the pH, but it's the pH that is the, the controlling factor. Uh, no direct relations between KH and the ability or number of the nitrifying bacteria in the system. Well, uh, ability and number, you can't go that far because if you have low KH, the bacteria are going to be, their ability, as I define ability, is going to be very limited. And so their numbers are going to be very low. And that's why we've said numerous times, if you're using a low pH or a soft water tank, low alkalinity tank, use better, you know, better quote, uh, higher pH, higher alkalinity water to get the bacteria established and then lower the KH and lower the pH to your target. Because now you've built a huge reservoir of bacteria and they're all working slower, but you have a bunch of them working slower. Where if you start out the other way, right from the get-go with low pH and low alkalinity, that those few bacteria, nitrifiers that you're starting with are going to take so long to multiply that it's going to take a long, long time for the system to grow enough bacteria to handle the ammonia that you're adding to the system. Make sense, Hillary? I think so, yeah. yeah. So uh, um, it's great to have questions. I know we've got somebody writing on a regular basis from Cyprus. Oh, nice. That's exciting. So yeah, that was, that was one of, like I said, one of the questions that came in on YouTube. So if you're listening to this and you're listening to it um, as a podcast, but you would prefer to um, watch it as a podcast, we do have a YouTube channel and you can go there and watch, listen to it as well. Okay. Our next question, this is one that came in on the info. Um, I have shortened it up a little bit because there was a lot of information to it. Um, I have a 50 gallon tank with uh, live rock and live pink sand. I used a four ounce bottle of one and only as well as the ammonia chloride. Um, on day 14, my results were pH of eight, ammonia of zero, nitrite of one. I did a water change um, and waited out a little bit longer, hoping to get my nitrites down. In day 21, the test results are staying pretty much the same, and I'm not sure what to do at this point. Have I done something wrong by not adding fish and by doing a water change on day 14? 
or is it okay for the nitrates to get that high with the nitrite just sitting at one? Any guidance is appreciated. So the they they sent because you did send me this email and they sent I a, did. A <laughs> There's a lot of information on this one I'm leaving out. So I did include all of the information. He's got that. I just didn't read it all for you. <laughs> yeah. So basically when you when you I get emails or we get emails like this, what I look at is the nitrate is at 160 on day one. So e even if they're using a kit that's measuring the ion, um, because I mean, how did it get that? How did it get that high? Uh, but but they're probably using a kit that's measuring the nitrite ion. And so for long time readers, you know, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to convert that to nitrate nitrogen. So I'm going to divide it by 4.5, or let's just say four real quick. So, so their nitrate is at 40 nitrate nitrogen. So the system is nitrifying. You're not going to get that nitrate without the ammonia being converted. I mean, they have it on day, uh, actually they don't have any nitrate at the beginning, but we'll assume that it was zero. But, but so they've added ammonia one, day one, or day zero, day three, day six, they did a water change. Um, and the system is nitrifying, evidenced by high nitrate, but there's this constant low level one of nitrite. What's going on there? We see this a lot when people use live sand. And basically the live sand has a lot of organics in it. And that those organics are slowly being decomposed or broken down by heterotrophs. And you've, it, it takes time for this to occur. And it takes time for the nitrifiers to be able to handle that much. And again, I think it becomes a, a factor where the heterotrophs are grabbing all the micronutrients out of the system. I, I would imagine this tank has probably unmeasurable levels of phosphate. And we don't talk about phosphate too much in terms of it being necessary. All organisms, bacteria, archaea, all extant, fancy word for living, you know, all known living organisms on earth need phosphate. And so if you limit it, which is generally hard to do, but in a new aquarium, there aren't that many levels of phosphate, except you've added this uh, live sand, which has a lot of organics, which can produce a lot of phosphate, but you've got the bacteria in the live sand, the heterotrophs that are breaking the organics down, and they grow so much faster than the nitrifiers that basically they're stealing those micronutrients. And that's why I've said, I said earlier, and I think with the first question Hillary had, is limit the organics and the and the heterotrophic bacteria in the beginning because the nitrifiers they take a day to divide the heterotrophs take 20 minutes so it, it's just not even a fair fight here for these nutrients um so try to limit that um and they're not doing i mean did they do anything wrong by not adding fish and by doing a water change no there's nothing wrong the water change stirs up they you know, probably caught just by doing the water chain, stirred up the gravel. That again, adds oxygen to the organics there. And that's going to spur a growth or a bloom of the bacteria and breaking down more organics. In my experience, using live sand, you're going to have this low nitrite level for three to four weeks. It just seems to take that long for it to disappear. Um, and, and then they ask, you know, is it okay for the nitrates to get that high with the nitrite sitting at one? Yeah, nit nitrate, it, it doesn't matter how really how high it's, it's not going to harm anything short term. Long term, you know, you, you're risking the algae outbreaks and things like that. Um, so I would prefer to do kind of a water change. And, and the quandary, though, 
is when you set up a tank and you're doing a water change, what we normally say is don't gravel wash because the nitrifiers are in the substrate. And if you, if you gravel wash your substrate or siphon clean your substrate, you risk removing the nitrifiers because it takes time for them to adhere to the substrate, you know, and, and, and you know, really adhere so that the siphon action doesn't remove them. But on the other hand, you've got all these organics, which are just going to be pesky for, you know, up to four weeks being broken down and you want to get rid of them. So the answer is to gravel wash a little bit every few days. And, you know, take a section, gravel wash it, wait a day or two, take another section, gravel wash it, and get all these organics out. But give the nitrifiers time to kind of recolonize a little bit. Um, but that's that's what I would recommend for this person. And this is actually kind of common when, when using live sand that you get this pesky low levels of nitrite. Uh, now, the other thing that can ha be happening is there's still, you know, a group out there that their gospel is to use thick grav gravel, you know, sand beds, two inches, three inches, four inches. And if you've got live sand that thick, the chances are pretty high that you're anaerobic. And anaerobic, that you're getting what would might be called, you might be getting uh, imp. Or, par or partial denitrification. So you're actually denitrifying and the steps are to take nitrate to nitrite and then to dinitrogen. There's a couple of intermediates in there, but when you have partial denitrification, it's really common to be producing nitrite. And that's especially true when you first set up, set up your denitrifying filter. And here, basically a thick sand bed or live sand bed is acting as a denitrifying filter, but it's only partially completing the task and it's actually producing nitrite. Um, I mean, the only way to know that, well, if you stir up the sand bed a little bit and see uh, bubbles come up, that's anaerobic uh if you can see black along the sides of the glass or the you know, sides of the tank down low into the substrate that's that sign of uh, uh anaerobic because you're producing hydrogen sulfide so it's anoxic uh which is even you can worse. smell it you can smell it yeah <laughs> uh not a big fan of definitely not a big fan of thick live sand substrates, just basically ticking time bombs. Does that answer that? I think this actually, it did. And it, it kind of leads perfectly into our next question. Um, I was wondering if the diamond head goby would be a good choice for a cleanup crew in my 350 liter aquarium. Will it damage the sand and the ben beneficial bacteria and organisms? What would you suggest for cleaning the sand in the form of a cleanup crew. I love gobies. Uh, I just, I think I could watch them all day. If you can get a couple next to each other where they're taking sand out of their hole, going over their neighbor and spitting it in there. Yeah. <laughs> all day long. All day long. Um, that's a great fish. You, you don't worry about the nitrifiers. Even them moving the sand they're aerating that's why they're you know that's a great thing to have because they're keeping that sand loose so the water can get in there oxygen can get in there and they're not really ingesting that sand to the point where they're harming the nitrifying bacteria so not even a consideration um it'd, it'd be wonderful to have a tank that looks like those uh you know you've seen it on movies or scuba diving where you look out and all the gobies poke their heads up you know, they're symmetrical. Everyone's like six inches from each other. That'd be a wonderful looking tank. But, uh, you know, yeah. you've got that tank in, in the office. You should do that in that tank. You might not be able to have tons of them, but. Oh, thanks, Hillary. At least one or two. I'm just saying. <laughs> okay. You yeah. don't have to go to the ocean. It could be in the office. That's true. That's true. There you go. Next question. I have an experience 
expired bottle of nitrifying bacteria. It's from 2020. It's been in the refrigerator all this time. Can I still use it? And if so, will it work? Uh, yes, it should work. Um, I mean, 2020, this is the beginning of 2021. So if it expired in December, it's still good. If it expired in early 2020, it's not going to work as fast. So, so the bacteria don't have this, you know, black and white cutoff point. Generally, if they've been in the refrigerator the whole time, the clock pretty much stops to a certain extent stops ticking. Uh, and they should be pretty good. The one uh, group, the nitrite oxidizers are the ones that are affected the most by long-term storage. Um, and again, if you're fishless cycling, start out with one drop per gallon, just a little bit of ammonia to get, cause the bacteria have gone dormant and you've got to kind of wake them up. So hit them with a small amount of ammonia at first, let them take that and then add some more ammonia and just, you know, you can add ammonia every day a little bit, but, uh, it's, they're a lot better than nothing. Um, the bacteria aren't dead. They're just as, you know, I've said many times, kind of like a rechargeable battery. And the recharge is to get them in good conditions, warm water, and a little bit of ammonia in the system. And they'll come right back and start working. So do not throw it away. Should be fine. Will absolutely do no harm um, to the system. All right. Good to know. Okay, I'm just going to go over this quickly because I believe this is the one that you were referencing earlier. Hey, I've got a new 55 gallon tank. Day one, I added one and only and ammonia and I followed the instructions on the calendar from the website. Now I'm on day seven and the ammonia is still reading four to five parts per million. The pH is 6.8, nitrite is two. Do you have any recommendations for what to do next? Yeah, that's the one, because after a few questions, we find out they're using, is it deionized or RO? Doesn't matter. They're using a really, they're using soft, you know, water. And I, so that's what's happening here is there's very little alkalinity. There's very little hardness. Remember, hardness is calcium and magnesium. Alkalinity is your buffering. And uh, low alkalinity, low hardness, low pH no go on the nitrifying. It's going to take a long, it just is very slow. So again, um, best to, you got, you got a couple of things you can do. Uh, stop adding so much ammonia because you just, it's going to take a while or change the water, use better water quality for the nitrifiers. This may not be what the, for the fish you want to keep, but for the nitrifiers, use better water quality, meaning higher pH, higher hardness, higher alkalinity. Get a bunch of them established, get a really big filter established, and then you can change the water slowly to this softer water that you're wanting, assuming for some type of uh, South American uh, fish. All righty. Well, that is actually all of the questions that I've got for today. Um, is there any of you stick in mind that you've seen or talked to people and have had come up in conversation? Well, they're, they're pretty standard, you know, people cycling with, with soft water or live sand. I mean, those are two common things. Um, and we deal with that a lot. So, um, it's just understanding that the nitrifiers are living organisms and they have preferences. Luckily, they are pretty robust. If, if you grow nitrifiers in soft water, they're growing solely, but they're not dead. Uh, if they're in a bottle for a long time, they stopped. You know, they, they, they're not dead. It really takes a lot to kill these things. You got to break the cell wall, poison the cell. Um, they, they, so, so they can come back. You just have to slow down a little bit and give them a little time to, uh, to come back. But, but the numbers are there. It's just basically, I hate to be anthropomorphic, but it's basically waking them up. 
All right, sounds good. You know, I feel like the theme for so many of these questions that we get and like the frustrations that people have, like, just be patient, just be patient. Patience will get you so far. It, it, it is patience, patience, patience. You kind of understand though people are excited and, and they want to get things going, but a little, you know, slower at, in the beginning. And then remember these bacteria are doubling slow. They double, they double, they double, and then they can work rapidly. So establish a good foundation and the bacteria will reward you by cycling fast. Start off poorly and it not in most in almost all cases not people's fault just uneducated you know you know people don't know about it um and you're just going to be stuck because the conditions never get to the point where the bacteria can really multiply rapidly but that's why we're here that's why we do these questions and answers Yep. And so on that note, if you have a question that you would like answered, you can come and see us at any of the trade shows. But if you'd like a more timely response, um, reach out to us on any of our social media platforms. We're on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. Or you can always send us an email at info at drtimsaquatics.com. Things are a little bit crazy now, so it may take a day or two for us to get to you, but we're here to help. All right. Well, okay. as always, great talking to you and go and doing another Dr. Tim's Aquatic Podcast. And uh, I guess for you and I, next up is the Aquaculture Show in a few weeks. Yeah, I'm so excited for this. It's been years since I've been. So, all right, everybody, this is Dr. Tim and Hillary. Thanks for listening. And until next time, good fish keeping.